our, our talk today is going to be given by Dr. Lisa Mullen um, on the title Orwell and the Politics of Feeling. So Lisa teaches modern and contemporary literature and film at the University of Cambridge, where her work spans questions of embodiment, echopoesis, and the ethics of hermeneutics of form. She's the author of Mid-Century Gothic, The Uncanny Objects of Modernity in British Literature and Culture After the Second World War, uh, which came out with Manchester University Press in 2019. And she recently edited the OUP's Oxford World Classics edition of Homage to Catalonia. Um, and her next book, which I believe it, it provides the basis for the talk today, will be titled Orwell Unwell, Interruptions of Embodiment in the Fiction and Journalism of George Orwell. So this is gonna talk for a, about an hour or so, and then we'll take questions um, afterwards. Um, so over, over to you, Lisa, and I believe you've got slides to share as well. Thanks very much, Chris. And thank you also to um, Nathan for inviting me to talk to you today about Orwell. Um, it's great to be here and I thoroughly enjoyed listening to all the papers yesterday and I'm looking forward to, to more great, um, great sort of thinking and talking about Orwell later. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, here we go. Let's see. There you go. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so as I say, it's great to be among so many people uh, who feel as strongly about Orwell as I do. And we do, I think, tend to feel strongly about Orwell. Anyone who's been working on Orwell for the past few years, and I think that's probably bound to include quite a few of you, may know a certain set of feelings. These have ebbed and flowed with the tides of recent politics and debates, all of which seem in one way or another to trigger the evocation of Orwell and his ideas from social media surveillance to Trumpian post-truth, from Me Too to cancel culture, the pros and cons of fascism, <clears throat> or the fascist propaganda of Putinist Russia. There's the gigantic image of Orwell projected into the public square, firmly tagged as definitely meaning or intending to mean this or that, and absolutely a sworn enemy of the other. For those of us who've read a lot of Orwell, our feelings about this may be mixed, Unease will be part of it, perhaps frustration too, irritation at times for sure, an enraged protectiveness when bad actors misconstrue Orwell's words in order to dragoon, dragoon him into some kind of right-wing conspiracy theory, embarrassment at other times, even vicarious shame when he's caught bang to rights with some dodgy opinions about race, gender or class. Then there are the feelings which are invoked directly by the text, Orwell is a master at conveying a kind of creeping dread, in his novels especially. I think it's there all the way from Burmese days to 1984. And his non-fiction is often laced with a kind of tight-lit anger, which occasionally explodes into rage when Orwell has to lay out the details of egregious injustice or pompous idiocy. Less typically, there are the moving passages filled with a beatific appreciation of the natural world, and I want to return to those later in the talk. And there is one instance, I think, of a grand vert vertiginous pathos, the death of Boxer in Animal Farm, which upset me so much as a child that I used to have regular nightmares about it. What should we do with these feelings? What do they add? This is a conference which invites us above all to be critical, to engage with Orwell as a critic himself, and as the name attached to a set of texts and ideas which are susceptible to criticism. So in this talk, I want to ponder the operative qualities of that notion of critique and to think about what feeling or feelings might have to do with it. Before going any further, it's worth emphasizing the doubleness of that word feeling, which evokes both sensation and emotion. Increasingly, it appears that this is a distinction without a real difference. Scientific research has revealed that the body-mind divide is biologically, even ontologically, unsustainable. In fact, our inner lives and our sensory apparatus are helplessly and hopelessly entangled. Mirror neurons were discovered 20 years ago, brain cells which respond identically whether you are performing an action yourself or only watching it being performed by someone else. And this has revolutionized the science of feeling and raises questions about emotion too. Do mirror neurons explain empathy? And if so, is the failure or refusal of empathy a question of pathology 
or the sign of an artwork which is unconvincingly mimetic. Are our critical responses to cultural artifacts different in any meaningful way from our neurological ones? This is a question I've argued interested Orwell too, as he lived through an earlier revolution in neuroscience. I wrote about this in an article for the BMJ Medical Humanities Journal. I became fascinated by the idea that uh, 1984 is among other things, concerned with the epistemological differences between psychology and neurology. The party, it seems to me, only pretend to be interested in psychology. In the Ministry of Love, we discover that they are less concerned with producing compliance via the negotiated truth capture of the psychoanalytic encounter than they are with the brute force biological interventions of 1940s neuroscience, namely electroconvulsive therapy and some kind of technological lobotomy. What terrified Orwell most was what he refers to as the few cubic centimetres inside your skull, in which Winston hopes to hide his subversive thoughts, <clears throat> that that might finally be cracked open by some kind of neurobiological attack, sabotaging the body, which had until then been the last bulwark, protecting the autonomy of the individual mind. This is the same fear that I think motivates those who harbour the fashionable paranoid fantasies of our moment, craziness about brain, microchip brain implantation, zombifying 5G networks and vaccine-based gene manipulation. If our bodies house and harbour our precious minds, this reasoning says, um, what if that same vessel of vulnerable flesh walking around out there in the real world could be turned against us? It's the triumph of paranoia that it allows fear to escape from the realm of the psychological and act itself out. I think it's interesting that the image of the psychoanalytic diagnostic encounter is what persists most powerfully in the realm of culture, not only as a narrative motif, but as a metaphor for meaning, as something to be dug up from the depths. In this schema, the desire for diagnosis can be redrawn as just another fancy schmancy form of paranoia in itself. Debates about diagnostic critique, otherwise known following Eve Sedgwick and Paul Ricoeur respectively as paranoid reading or the hermeneutics of suspicion, reignited a few years ago in the wake of Rita Felsky's intervention. Felsky's post-critical position attempted to reappraise the various feelings associated with literary criticism, rejecting suspicion and its pervasive presence as mood and method, as she calls it, within the literary academy. Yet Felsky does not explicitly address the strange agreement between, if not conflation of, these two terms, which she seems to take for granted. The diaphanous qualities of mood might seem to be inimical to the firm procedural apparatus of something called method. Yet her problem with suspicious or paranoid reading practices is not that they're founded on emotional responses, but rather that these feelings are in some way reified and deadened as emotions, baked into critique so that they're produced algorithmically instead of arising spontaneously from the realm of sensory experience and contingency. If Felsky's delineation of what post-critique might look like remains vague, we might turn to affect theory to understand why feelings like paranoia might seem so problematically intrinsic to the practice of reading. Affect theorists like Sian Nagai, Lauren Ballant, Brian Masumi and others make the case for emotional critique as a productive way out of the semiotic impasses of other kinds of theory. The epistemological paralysis of Frederick Jameson's political unconscious, for instance, or of course, Foucault's hegemonic constructivism. Effective criticism, according to its proponents, pays attention rather to the textures of embodied experience and the personal encounters of the everyday, finding in affect a politically generative liberation from the totalizing reflexes of quote unquote critique. More to the point, negative feeling can yield a positive politics. By making us feel the disjunction between the sanctioned structures of capitalist affect, most obviously elaborated on a continuum between aspirational dissatisfaction and nostalgic sentimentality, and the aesthetic and embodied aspects of unease about these economically productive emotions. Unease which goes against the cultural grain and opens up a space for subversive thinking. 
Zian Nagai has delineated the nexus of embodiment, emotion and politics, which signals the emergence and discloses the importance of so-called ugly feelings. Her book, Ugly Feelings, explores what she calls ambivalent situations of suspended agency by examining affective gaps and illegibilities, dysphoric feelings and other sites of emotional negativity. Nagai approaches such minor emotions as irritation, paranoia and anxiety, both as politically charged effective labour and as markers of social, ethical or political dysfunction, regarding them as unusually knotted or, content or condensed interpretations of embodied predicaments, which can be recuperated for their critical product productivity. As Nagai, following Adorno, of course, surmises, in 20th century commodity culture, affect is emotion bred, as it were, on an agar plate, microscoped and sequenced, so that desire becomes acquisitiveness, longing becomes nostalgia, and hope becomes that quality which Lauren Ballant so precisely and devastatingly identified as cruel optimism. For Nagai, in other words, bad feelings alert us to a politics which is not beyond consciousness as such, but is rather embedded in the very architecture of con consciousness, ready to spring out at us, waving red flags. To quote one more name from the affect pantheon, Sarah Ahmed has summed up this turn, as she wrote in 2004 in the cultural poetic politics of emotion, feelings become fetishes through the erasure of the history of their production and circulation. That's ultimately why effective critics from Eve Sedgwick onwards have railed against the urge to diagnose a text's occluded pathologies, to interrogate its political prevarications or expose its apparatic inconsistencies, or actions which end in a kind of sterile pessimism. Phenomenology offers a way to push back against this kind of paranoid reading, locating in the body a firmer epistemological ground, what Orwell called in a 1936 letter to Henry Miller, his belly to earth attitude. For Sedgwick, bodily feeling is a defense against the constructivist pieties of theory with a capital T, and ultimately a more reparative way of reading. But for Orwell, the body was always more political than that. It was both the site and the instrument of an uncaveated form of resistance, perhaps even a truly socialist way of reading and being. In a sense, 1984 anticipates the hermeneutics of suspicion and Sedgwick's critique of paranoia. Winston puts a misplaced premium on precious forms of knowledge to which he does not have access and which he therefore must strive to get his hands on. I can't help thinking that Sedgwick might have had this in the back of her mind when she wrote in Touching Feeling her imaginary encounter with the deinstitutionalized person on the street who, betrayed and plotted against by everyone else in the city, still urges on you the finger-worn dossier bristling with his precious correspondence. Just as Winston is fatally fooled by the seductive narrative of the secret brotherhood and the sacred mysteries of the Goldstein book, Sedgwick's paranoid street person demands that true meaning must be manifested textually, but ends up with a screed of meaningless words. Moreover, she feels with Orwell the chilling implications of a critical practice which prioritizes the unveiling of mysteries and thus leads to a politics of hypervisibility and the abolition of the darkness which harbors privacy. State violence, she points out, was from the beginning exemplary and spectacular. What does a hermeneutics of suspicion and exposure have to say to social formations in which visibility itself constitutes much of the violence. The point of the reinstatement of chain gangs in several southern states is less that convicts be required to perform hard labor than that they be required to do so under the gaze of the public. Today, it is no longer op opponents, but death penalty cheerleaders flushed with triumphal ambitions who consider that the proper place for ex executions is on television. Not only do we hear more echoes here of 1984, where the population is cowed and disciplined by institutionalized hypervisibility, while the punishment for dissent happens in a place where, as O'Brien puts it, there is no darkness. We might also wonder if Sedgwick has in mind the spectacular execution described in what I think is Orwell's most politically devastating essay, A Hanging. 
This is one of the earliest instances of what would be Orwell's ongoing elaboration of and anxiety about the relationship between vision and feeling. Eyes in a hanging are the portal to the body and to bodily and then conceptual and then intellectual sympathy with the victim of state violence. In contrast to the paranoia of capitalist politics, colonial structures of discipline focus on the dehumanizing control and capture of bodies. This has myriad implications for anti-colonial and decolonial resistance, of course, but Orwell is more interested in his own colonial shame, a feeling which transmits itself from the body of the condemned man directly to Orwell's own. A hanging is not a conceptual form of oppression for the victim or for those charged with delivering him to the gallows, but one which is decidedly haptic. The soldiers, Orwell writes, crowded very close about him, with their hands always on him in a careful, caressing grip, as though all the while feeling to make sure he was there. It was like men handling a fish which is still alive and may jump back into the water. And of course, famously, it is the man's instinctive assertion of his own bodily autonomy, simply to avoid getting his feet wet, which hits Orwell the hardest. When I saw the prisoner step aside to avoid the puddle, I saw the mystery, the unspeakable wrongness of cutting a life short when it is in full tide. This man was not dying. He was alive just as we were alive. All the organs of his body were working, bowels digesting food, skin renewing itself, nails growing, tissue forming, all toiling away in solemn foolery. His nails would still be growing when he stood on the drop, when he was falling through the air with a tenth of a second to live. His eyes saw the yellow gravel and the grey walls and his brain still remembered, foresaw, reasoned, reasoned even about puddles. He and we were a party of men walking together, seeing, hearing, feeling, understanding the same world. In two minutes, with a sudden snap, one of us would be gone, one mind less, one world less. So here is the answer to Sedgwick's point about paranoia as a demand that hidden mysteries be unveiled. No act of reading or interpretation intervenes in order to reveal the wrongness to Orwell. Indeed, it is explicitly described as unspeakable, beyond the realm of words and texts. But then, after the clarity of this revelation, we get jolted back to the murky world of bad feelings, the obscenely inappropriate emotions of relief and merriment, inaugurated by a distanced prosthetic touch. The superintendent reached out with his stick and poked the bare body. It oscillated slightly. He's all right, said the superintendent. He backed out from under the gallows and blew out a deep breath. The moody look had gone out of his face quite suddenly. An enormous relief had come upon us now that the job was done. One felt an impulse to sing, to break into a run, to snigger. All at once, everyone began chattering gaily. That touch of the stick is something I will return to, but for now I want to notice what Orwell does here with his feelings. The recognition of the crime had come like a lightning bolt of embodied clarity, but the shame is translated, it's mediated. It's conveyed not through the description of shame as a feeling, but via the misplaced frivolity, which is not understood to mask the shame exactly, but to be somehow identical to it a conflation of mask and reality, which for Orwell was essential to colonial feeling, and incidentally crops up again very explicitly in Shooting an Elephant. This is Orwell's most bitter indictment of colonialism, not the bare crimes committed on the bodies of the indigenous population, but the disgusting occlusion of feeling, which allows the British enforcers to translate their proper emotions into something more manageable. And perhaps this is precisely what is weaponized in reverse by the party in 1984. Room 101 operates ultimately by re-engaging the suppressed feelings of the body. Winston's sickening self-disgust when he gazes at his broken body in the mirror is itself the mirror image of Orwell's recognition of the embodied reality of the condemned prisoner walking to the gallows. Orwell was sharply alert to the politics involved in the distortion and deracination of emotion, and the way that might be felt in a place beyond language, a place Raymond Williams called the edge of semantic availability. Williams' own formulation of structures of feeling has perhaps surprisingly been largely overlooked by proponents of affect theory. 
<clears throat> and but he focused his criticism of Orwell on the problematic politics of Orwellian emotion. For Williams, structures of feeling relate to emergent semantic formations, formations which are derived from social experience and thus ultimately ideology. They present social experience in solution, as he puts it, so that they are only detectable by a kind of instinctive recognition rather than an intellectual analysis. For Williams then, the presence of feeling is an indication of the presence of something as yet indistinct or inapprehensible. It is a staging post along a pathway to political salience, a hint of change on the wind. For Orwell, this teleology was less linear if it existed at all. Feeling for him could indeed index the disturbance or modification of the dominant meanings of things, but could do so without revving up for a, a new iteration of social semantics. Ultimately, the result of feeling was political in the sense of ethical, not as in Williams, in the sense of ideological. This was the fundamental argument that Williams had with Orwell, whom he called the voice of political disillusion of the inevitable failure of revolution and of socialism. For Orwell, I would argue, the inevitable failure of revolutionary feeling was no failure at all if it stood for the failure of a totalizing Manichaean system of political thought. Nevertheless, there is something treacherous about Orwell's experience of his own bodily feeling. I've always been struck by an anecdote which DJ Taylor includes in his biography of Orwell, a wartime meeting with Anthony Pohl, in which Pohl was dressed in military uniform. Pohl expected Orwell to adopt an anti-military pose and braced himself to deflect a measure of leftist scorn, but Orwell surprised him. Do your trousers strap under your foot? He asked. Pohl confirmed that yes, they did. Orwell, who had worn trousers in a similar arrangement in Burma, immediately leapt to the realm of sensory memory. Those straps under the foot, he confided, give you a feeling like nothing else in life. The exchange was remembered by Pohl as amusing eccentricity, but to me this is so, intense, in, so intensely and interestingly characteristic of Orwell. The feel of the thing was the first semantic pathway to be illuminated, not the ideological implication, the skin contact of the uniform trousers being indelible and meaningful, and just as immediately legible now on another man's body as it had been on Orwell's own decades ago. The body then is more honest than words can be, and this may be inconvenient if you're trying to kid yourself or someone else. There's a paradox here in Orwell's respect for bodily feeling as the pre-linguistic nub of the matter. In politics in the English language, for instance, he writes that it's probably better to put off using words as long as possible and get one's meaning as clear as one can through pictures and sensations. Afterwards, one can choose not simply accept the phrases that will best cover the meaning. But it can cut the other way when words are weaponized. And this happens quite literally in Homage to Catalonia, where Orwell recalls the shouting war, which was fought between the fascist and the Republican trenches. <clears throat> mostly, <that's, clears throat> excuse me, mostly this was a question of lobbying verbal propaganda across no man's land. But the real blows were dealt by evoking sharply physical reactions in the listener. Orwell calls the principal shouter on his side an artist at the job. Sometimes, instead of shouting revolutionary slogans, he simply told the fascists how much better they were fed, we were fed than they were. His account of the government rations was apt to be a little imaginative. <clears throat> butter toast, you could hear his voice echoing across the lonely valley. We're just sitting down to buttered toast over here, lovely slices of buttered toast. I do not doubt that, like the rest of us, he had not seen butter for weeks or months past. But in the icy night, the news of buttered toast probably set many a fascist mouth watering. It even made mine water, though I knew he was lying. Physical feelings, then, are radically susceptible to abstract ideas in Spain. <clears throat> I seemed to feel in advance, he writes of an enemy soldier, the sensation of our bayonets crossing, and I wondered whether his arm would be stronger than mine. He tells us that you spend most of your time in the front line, wondering all the while just where the bullet will nip you. It gives your whole body a most unpleasant sensitiveness. Later in the same book, Orwell finds that even hearing about bullets evokes a physical reaction in his own body. 
the word shot gave me a sort of inward shudder. A bullet had entered my own body recently and the feeling of it was fresh in my memory. It's not nice to think of that happening to anyone you know. I'll return to that bullet, but let's pause for a moment to see where we've got to in our exploration of critical feelings. As we've seen, the body is essential to Orwell's political aesthetic. And we've considered how some of the critical interventions made by affect theory and the political moves of Raymond Williams's structures of feeling might illuminate how politics and the body read and write each other. I want now to think about why this was so important to Orwell and what his lifetime of ill health might have to do with it. And so we turn from affect to phenomenology as such. Throughout Orwell's work, it is the body which is compromised and reduced by bad politics and bad epistemology. From his earliest exposés of the individual lives of the poorest in society, in Down and Out in Paris and London and The Clergyman's Daughter, to his final attempt to grapple with fascism, Stalinism, and the biggest political questions of the 20th century. There is a clear and consistent line between the bad food and malnutrition suffered by the Orwell who writes Down and Out in Paris and London, and the corpulent wretchedness of George Bowling's self-alienation self in Coming Up for Air, and indeed from the bad sex which dismantles the life of the teak merchant Flory in Burmese days, to Winston Smith's last ditch attempt at physical fulfilment in his neurotically unerotic sex crimes with Julia. When the bad body is so often a testament to moral and social disintegration, it might seem to follow that a healthy body would be essential to the political remedies which Orwell wants to propose in different forms in his journalism, essays and fiction. Indeed, an ideal of health and strength did inform the moral paradigm exposed by some of his contemporaries, such as D.H. Lawrence, for instance. But instead, in Orwell's writing, bad feeling is not an aberration to be remedied and obliterated, but a meaningful moment of friction and information. I'm interested in how Orwell's attention to the intransigent materiality of the body, <clears throat> of the body interrupted or, or at least inflected the diagnostic and forensic mechanisms of his political epistemology. Despite his facility for resonant pro proclamations about truth and sense, the theoretical armature of Orwell's thought has a tendency to be inconsistent or non-existent. And this was not because he was incapable of thinking theoretically, but because he was opposed on some level to the notion of doing so. Orwell's comparative lack of interest in critiques of capitalism has marked him as a bad socialist in the eyes of some critics, although it made him perversely palatable to the anti-communist reactionaries of the Cold War era. As David Dwan has noted, Orwell had a problem with the epistemological tenets of Marxism itself, which he believed led to a fundamental untethering of theory from reality, and thus from freedom, equality, justice, and all the other philosophical principles which he held to be the essential goals of politics. Yet Orwell's alternative to the slipperiness of dialectical materialism might seem hard to discern, unless, that is, it is understood in terms of an emetic revulsion from lies, which is visceral rather than ideological or philosophical. <clears throat> The book I've been writing on Orwell and illness argues that by paying attention to Orwell's language of feeling, we can make sense of his nauseated recoil from fascism, falsehood, and the Cartesian body-mind dualism, which he repudiated. But the way Orwell tells it, writing a book at all amounts to having a bad feeling. It's a sign that things are going wrong, <clears throat> even I suppose if it qualifies as a referable output. Writing a book, Orwell declared in 1946, is a horrible, exhausting struggle, like a long bout of some painful illness. One would never undertake such a thing if one were not driven by some demon whom one could neither resist nor understand. So my own book takes seriously Orwell's metaphorical alignment of writing with illness. Specifically, it examines what's at stake for Orwell when a writer's body, which he believes should be the, the obedient index of his personhood, instead becomes an antagonist, interrupting the flow of his intellectual purpose with its material provocations, temporal precepts and complicated frailties. Orwell's premature death in 1950 was the end of a lifelong struggle with disease. Repeated bouts of childhood bronchitis left him with a chronic cough 
And over the course of his life, he endured pneumonia, dengue fever, a serious bullet wound, infertility, bronchiectasis, and finally tuberculosis, the infection which killed him. Over the course of his two parallel careers as an author and as a patient, Orwell's response to these bodily interruptions became more complex. Rather than simply resisting the cues and incentives of his recalcitrant flesh and blood, Orwell came to realise that the painful illness of his ailing body was the demon driving him to write. My argument is that this kind of metaphorical shift from illness to demon and from body to book is a typical stylistic move for Orwell, especially in his later writing, when his well-known appeals to clarity and plainness seem less an authorial manifesto than an attempt to resist or understand the complexity which is inherent to any intellectually honest work. Orwell's prose, like his body, was defined not by the easy transit of ideas, but by the horrible, exhausting, but vividly elaborated struggle to translate the physical imprint of experiences into concepts, words, and images. Orwell is not alone on the left in locating politics in the realm of the somatic. According to Herbert Marcuse, political rad radicalism must always be activated at the level of biology in the rift between capitalist structures and embodied reality. Freedom, he speculated in 1968, would become the environment of an organism which is no longer capable of adapting to the competitive performances required for well-being under domination no longer capable of tolerating the aggressiveness, brutality and ugliness of the established way of life. The rebellion would then have taken root in the very nature, the biology of the individual. Orwell's work anticipated this turn, but while he was responding to a similar Marxian insight about somatic resistance to the rarefied abstractions of capital and fetishization, he failed to share Marcuse's utopian predictions for the likely outcome of this tension. For Winston Smith, the party is defined as much by its suspicion of the body <clears throat> and as by its iron grip on the citizen mind. All the same, the body's relentless drive to interpret and respond to political reality may make it a potential reservoir of rebellion, but on Airstrip One, it's more likely to be the, a potential telltale. Your own worst enemy, Winston reflected, <clears throat> was your own your worst enemy, Winston reflected, was your own nervous system. At any moment, the tension inside you was liable to translate into some visible symptom. Thus, when in 1984, the party's final most essential command is to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears, Orwell is not implying that totalitarianism equates to a kind of sensory self-censorship, but rather that under fascism or totalitarianism, the neural pathways of meaning and truth will be severed or repurposed. The party wishes to reserve for itself the power of the body and to close down the recalcitrant potential of gut feelings and instinctive emotional responses like revulsion, disquiet and empathy. As Orwell wrote in Looking Back on the Spanish War, the people might initially swallow the promises of fascism, yet sooner or later they always take up the struggle again. They must do so because in their own bodies, they always discover that the promises of fascism cannot be fulfilled. Another key thinker about political aesthetics and a near contemporary of Orwell's was Walter Benjamin. And I think it's worth briefly noting the similarities and differences between their respective formulations. The coda to Benjamin's work of art essay contains one of the most famous articulations of this relationship. Fiat ars periat mundus, <clears throat> create art, destroy the world, says fascism, and expects war to supply, just as Marinetti confesses that it does, the artistic gratification of a sense perception that has been altered by technology. This is the obvious perfection of la pour la, humanity that, according to Homer, was once an, once an object of spectacle for the Olympic gods, now is one for itself. Its self-alienation has reached such a degree that it is capable of experiencing its own destruction as an aesthetic enjoyment of the highest order. So it is with the aestheticization of politics, which is being managed by fascism. Communism responds with the politicization of art. As Susan Buck Morse points out in her classic essay, Aesthetics and Anesthetics, Walter Benjamin's artwork essay, Reconsidered, 
Benjamin's analysis depicts the synesthetic human nervous system as a leaky and infinitely expansive construct. Not only is it not neatly contained within the individual body, but the system stretches out to include the entire external world of sensory stimulus, abolishing at a stroke the subject-object divide. But Morse emphasizes this because she wants to convince us of the radicalism of Benjamin's techniques and his insight into the dialectical potential of the modern body's imbrication with the new technological expansion of the human sensorium. She makes no apologies for declaring that Benjamin's insight, quote, changes the entire conceptual order of modernity, and perhaps she's right. Orwell arrived at an uncannily similar insight into the asceticization of politics and fascism and the need to politicize art in return. In Why I Write, he declares that his first close encounter with fascism in Spain convinced him of this when he says, what I have most wanted to do throughout the past 10 years is to make political writing into an art. It's the opening sentence of perhaps one of Orwell's most famous non-fiction paragraphs, and he knows full well that what he's saying is radical. This was written in 1946, and so his reference to 10 years ago points precisely to 1936 as his moment of political awakening. And that, of course, is the year not only of, uh, of his uh, trip to Spain, but also of the road to Wigan Pier. He goes on, when I sit down to write a book, I do not say to myself, I'm going to produce a work of art. I write it because there is some lie that I want to expose, some fact to which I want to draw attention, and my initial concern is to get a hearing. But I do not do the work of writing a book or even a long magazine article if it, <clears throat> if it were not also an aesthetic experience. Anyone who cares to examine my work will see that even when it is downright propaganda, it contains much that, is that, much that a full-time politician would consider irrelevant. I'm not able and do not want completely to abandon the worldview that I acquired in childhood. So long as I remain alive and well, I shall continue to feel strongly about prose style, to love the surface of the earth and to take a pleasure in solid objects and scraps of useless information. So unlike Benjamin, Orwell is equating political aesthetics with strong emotion and sensory pleasure. And he was deeply suspicious of technological mediation. In a typically combative passage from part two of The Road to Wigan Pier, he spells this out and makes clear the gulf between him and the Benjamin of the work of art essay. The tendency of mechanical progress, Orwell writes, is to frustrate the human need for effort and creation. It makes unnecessary and even impossible the activities of the eye and the hand. The apostle of progress will sometimes declare that this does not matter, but you can usually drive him into a corner by pointing out the horrible lengths to which the process can be carried. Why, for instance, use your hands at all? Why use them even for blowing your nose or sharpening a pencil? Surely you could fix some kind of steel and rubber contraption to your, to your shoulders and let your arms wither into stumps of skin and bone. And so with every organ and every faculty. Is aiming here to eviscerate the arts and crafts pretensions of Fabian style socialism, which he dismisses as utopians saving their souls through fretwork. But he's also, he is also concerned with mechanical reproduction as the death of art as such. The machine world would even encroach upon the activities we now class as art, he speculates. It is doing so already by the camera and the radio. Orwell's political aesthetics must strike a careful balance. The writer must hold himself hygienically separate from, the mechanical, from mechanical thinking in order to maintain aesthetic integrity. But to stay within the rarefied atmosphere of pure aesthetics means death. As he notes in Why I Write, he must write with a political purpose if he's to avoid writing, quote, lifeless books. Orwell, unlike Benjamin, has no use of the delicacy of dialectics. He must attempt to resolve the conflict between self-identical artistic autonomy and social solidarity. Orwell was no less exercised by the modern writer's paradoxical relationship with reality and no less concerned by the implications that that paradox had for the ability of art to combat fascism. 
but he worried deeply about the intervention of any mediating apparatus which might dull the immediacy of embodiment, including the technology of writing itself. Thus, his much debated pronouncement in the same essay that good prose is like a window pane seems to me to amount to recognition that reporting the truth is not the same as writing prose which describes a window pane through which truth might be glimpsed. The metaphor of the window pane becomes a metaphor for the inevitability of the loss of pure and direct truth. All the structural preconditions, biological, institutional, political, or economic, which must precede any attempt to write the truth. Orwell advocated for plain language, not because he believed it offered perfect transparency, but because he was worried that political writing might be bad art. It might not be aesthetic enough or aesthetic in the wrong way. It might become a mere mechanism, producing platitudinous truthiness, but lose its connection to the visceral feelings where politics should be born. <clears throat> as, ter as Terry Eagleton points, out in the ideology of the aesthetic, aesthetics is born as a discourse of the body. To quote a bit more Eagleton, the construction of the modern notion of aesthetic of the aesthetic artifact is inseparable from the construction of the dominant ideological forms of modern class society. Yet at the same time, <clears throat> the aesthetic understood in a certain sense provides an unusually powerful challenge and alternative to those dominant ideological forms, and is in this sense, an eminently contradictory phenomenon. The resolution to this contradiction emerges when the etymology of the aesthetic resurfaces. Eagleton notes that Alexander Baumgarten, who developed the idea of the aesthetic as a philosophical character category in his Aesthetica from 1750, refers to the Greek concept of aesthetikos, as that which is perceptive by feeling, and takes an anti-Cartesian line, which for Eagleton represents the first stirrings of a primitive materialism of the body's long inarticulate rebellion against the tyranny of the theoretical. The language of tyranny which Eagleton adopts here is not accidental. For Orwell too, materialism is the basis of any leftist critique. Orwell, however, declines to make the leap towards the dialectical materialism of Marxism, instead relying on the phenomenology, phenomenological and affective countertruths of the body. Yet while theorists of the body world, such as uh, Merleau-Ponty, build their philosophy outwards from a generic sense of normative embodiment, Orwell, like later phenomenologists of disability studies, such as Vivian Sobchak, understood how politics might arise from the interruptions to the seamless concept of a physical horizon, the kind of interruptions perpetrated by disease, by injury, and above all, by discomfort. In his 1946 essay on censorship, The Prevention of Literature, Orwell explicitly links sensory experience with truth. Orwell discusses the feelings of the fiction writer, quote, which from his point of view are facts. To falsify his own subjective experience would be to feel the same intellectual chill as the journalist who is forced to print lies. He goes on to argue that freedom of the intellect means the freedom to report what one has seen, heard and felt, and not to be obliged to fabricate imaginary facts and feelings. This construction preserves the ambiguity inherent in that word, feel. It's not clear whether Orwell is referring here to emotions or sensations, nor arguably was the distinction particularly meaningful as far as his argument was concerned. In either sense of the word, feelings provide an access to the irreducible reality of the inner world. He cannot represent the scenery of his own mind, Orwell says of the writer. If he is forced to do so, the only result is that his creative faculties dry up. And this metaphor of scenery is interesting, I think. It confirms the entanglement of the sensory realm and the threads of sensation, emotion, and affect from which subjecthood for Orwell is constructed. Rendered as a scenery, this set of impressions is resituated within the material dimension and reattached to the body which navigates and apprehends it. Often with Orwell, we find metaphor doing much of the conceptual heavy lifting when it comes to these manifesto-like proclamations about writerly practice and agency. 
And here, the metaphor of land is working hard to bridge the space between the metaphysical realm of embodied materiality with its political potential for collectivity and the individual mind where facts must be protected from metaphysical in interference, even <clears throat> or especially when they're explicitly facts belonging to a single point of view. The scenery evoked is not that of the picturesque, framed and curated for the benefit of a privileged onlooker, but is instead ecological in the strictest sense, <clears throat> that is concerned with personal oikos or home in all its entangled elaborations. The idea of the framing point of view evokes, um, um, ev evokes again that uh, one of Orwell's most famous and exhaustively discussed image, that of the window pane, the enigmatic analogue of something Orwell calls in why I write good prose. This murky square of metaphorical glass can and has been read as an image of clarity, of perceptual delimita delimitation, and as, as, and as, sorry, this murky square of metaphorical glass can and has been read as an image of clarity, <clears throat> and the, with the murky window pane of good prose also linking to the train window through which Orwell imagine, imagines himself surveying and understanding the plight of a poor woman who can only poke a blocked drain pipe of material disenfranch disenfranchisement with a stick in a despairing attempt to release its blocked flow. This train window, this stick and this drain pipe come from a deservedly famous passage in The Road to Wigan Pier. In it, Orwell describes the monstrous scenery through which his train is passing. The slag heaps, chimneys, piled scrap iron, foul canals, piles of cindery, cindery mud crisscrossed by the prints of clogs. They pass row after row of little grey slum houses. While at the back of one of these houses, a young woman was kneeling on the stones, poking a stick up the leaden waste pipe which ran from the sink inside and which I suppose was blocked. For Orwell, his instinctive sympathy for her plight is enough to disprove any patronising assumption that the poor are different from the middle classes. For what I saw in her face, he writes, was not the ignorant suffering of an animal. She knew well enough what was happening to her, understood as well as I did how dreadful a destiny it was to be kneeling there in the bitter cold on the slimy stones of a slum backyard, poking a stick up a foul drain pipe. Now, I wonder if this moment of radical empathy is informed as much by the stick as by the slimy stones or the woman's facial expression. When I spoke earlier about a hanging, I pointed out that the moment of somatic identification with the condemned man was broken by the touch of a stick on his corpse. There, the stick acted as a reminder of distance, re-establishing the quote-unquote proper anaesthetic severance of the colonial enforcer from his own embodied sense of justice. Here, the stick performs the opposite function, because Orwell has, to this extent at least, shaken himself out of that total numbness. But still, like the window pane, the stick remains a metaphor of sensory mediation. In Phenomenology of Perception, Merleau-Ponty considers the blind man's stick as an apparatus in order to demonstrate what he calls the chiasmic correlation of being and world. It is our ability to feel with the insensate objects which touch our bodies that helps us to define the dimensional space through which we move and operate. In fact, he begins uh, not with a stick, but with a hat. A woman may, he says, without any calculation, keep a safe distance between the feather in her hat and things which might break it off. She feels where the feather is just as we feel where our hand is. If I'm in the habit of driving a car, I enter a narrow opening and see that I can get through without comparing the width of the opening with that of the wings, just as I go through a doorway without checking the width of the doorway against that of my body. And he goes on, the blind man's stick has ceased to be an object for him and is no longer perceived for itself. Its point has become an area of sensitivity, extending the scope and active radius of, radius of touch and providing a parallel to sight. In the exploration of things, the length of the stick does not enter expressly as a middle term, as an entity in itself. Rather, the blind man is aware of it through the, 
through the position of objects through it. The position of things is immediately given through the extent of the reach which carries him to it, which comprises, besides the arm's reach, the stick's range of action. So this coupling of our feeling to the insensate dimensions of an object exposes, and I'd argue aestheticizes, the relationship between the conscious self and the perceptible materiality of the all the non-self stuff which surrounds it. But for Orwell, unlike for Merleau-Ponty, this inevitably politicizes that relationship. The stick which the woman uses to probe the drain pipe in Wigan Pier <clears throat> links her sensorium phenomenologically with the blockage that she's trying to dislodge, but it also creates an emotional chiasmus of intersecting personal and social misery, which momentarily fractures the window pane of class. Orwell simultaneously experiences the scopic mastery afforded to him by the, his train window and the synesthetic echoing of feeling which the sight of the woman affords him. A feeling with is necessarily created in order for the politics of the connection to be apparent and the stick mediates it. Class is the glass which numbs feeling as sensation. The stick models properly embodied touch and feeling in a way that the window cannot. This distinction Orwell makes clear within the pages of Wigan Pier itself, where he notes that this curse of class difference confronts you like a wall of stone, or rather, it's not so much like a stone wall as the plate glass pane of an aquarium. It's so easy to pretend that it isn't there and so impossible to get through it. Unfortunately, it is nowadays the fashion to pretend that the glass is penetrable. So if the glass forms the, an impenetrable barrier to class sympathy, how can the politics of touch be restored and Orwell, the class tourist, be redeemed? This must happen imaginatively and aesthetically, not through reason and her hermeneutic method. As he puts it, again, this is from Wigan Pier, <clears throat> I could go among these people, see what their lives were like and feel myself temporarily part of their world. Once I had been among them and accepted by them, I should have touched bottom. This is what I felt. I was aware even then that it was irrational. Part of my guilt was dropped from me. So in his trip to the north of England, that sympathetic revelation remains fleeting. But the following year, Orwell came a step closer to achieving it in a more sustained way. Homage to Catalonia begins with a description of a kind of cleansing political epiphany, which Orwell experienced on his arrival in Barcelona, a city which appears to him to be stripped of all the stifling norms and reactionary conventions which define a bourgeois city, instead standing as a shining beacon of social equality and fraternity. In the opening page of the book, he sets up a young Italian militiaman as the embodiment of this sense of revolutionary ecstasy. The man is a tough looking youth of, 20, of 25 or six with reddish brown hair and powerful shoulders. And he's explicitly described as inhabiting the realm of the physical, but unable to engage with the conceptual realm symbolized by a map he is studying due to the fact that he is unable to read. Something in his face deeply moved me, Orwell writes. It was the face of a man who would commit murder and throw away his life for a friend. There was both candor and ferocity in it. Also the pathetic reverence that illiterate people have for their supposed superiors. Obviously he could not make head or tail of the map. Obviously he regarded map reading as a stupendous intellectual feat. Orwell and the Italian literally speak different languages, but they also operate, Orwell implies, within a different semiotic universe. Orwell, the compulsive reader and writer, makes his living from interpreting and passing the hidden meanings of things. The Italian soldier is a man of pure embodied action. Despite or because of this, all experiences a strong sense of sympathy, which is sealed by a gesture. As we went out, he stepped across the room and gripped my hand very hard. It was as though his spirit and mine had momentarily succeeded in bridging the gulf of language and tradition and meeting in utter intimacy. Homage to Catalonia <clears throat> is Orwell's account of his fall from this moment of grace, a fall which forced him to rethink his utopian politics by viewing them through the phenomenological window of a different, less ideal sense of a soldier's sensorium, his own half-starved, dirty, louse-ridden body. 
Much of the book is concerned with Orwell's various haptic encounters with the fascist enemy and with feelings of cold, hunger, boredom and danger. Crucial moments when intimate touch takes the place of voice and utterance. The fraternal handshake with the Italian militiamen will find its mirror image in Orwell's tense handshake, handshake with an unnamed Spanish colonel at the end of the book, offered in a moment of hasty and perilous friendship, despite the fact that Orwell is by now on the run as a suspected fascist spy. Everything had changed for Orwell, and it changed most uh, vividly in the trenches of Aragon, when a bullet from a fascist sniper pierced Orwell's throat, missing his carotid artery by millimetres before exiting cleanly through the back of his neck. Orwell experienced his shooting as a vivid but intensely uncomfortable moment of epiphanic sensation and emotional presence. There's something very moving about how quietly Orwell describes this. His mind was abruptly severed from the sensations of his body at this moment, and he describes a sense of utter weakness, a feeling of being stricken and shriveled up to nothing. The next moment my knees crumpled up and I was falling, my head hitting the ground with a violent bang, which my, to, to my relief did not hurt. I had a numb, dazed feeling, a consciousness of being very badly hurt, but no pain in the ordinary sense. He tries to recall as best he can what went through his head at this moment thoughts of his wife, a certain grudging admiration for the fascist sniper who had caught him, and pity for the men carrying his stretch of the mile and a half to the nearest ambulance over what he calls vile going, lumpy, slippery tracks. But here he says something very interesting. Oh, sorry. The leaves of the silver poplars which in places fringed our trenches brushed against my face. I thought what a good thing it was to be alive in a world where silver poplars grow. The strangely intimate touch of the leaves on his face produces a rush of tenderness, which bears witness to an irreducible somatic connection with the natural landscape and human relationships based on compassion and tactile care. The physical feeling of the poplars touching <clears throat> is, I would argue, the most direct link between homage to Catalonia and the novel Orwell wrote straight afterwards, coming up for air, a novel which arranges itself around a pool of water fringed with poplars. Coming up for air aches with nostalgia for a lost English landscape which might enfold and nourish the human, but which, ne which may never have ex existed outside the imagination. Its protagonist, George Bowling, is a travelling salesman who lives in a sleekly well-fed and well-cushioned body. And when he parks his car by the side of the road to pick primroses, he does so clumsily and guiltily. Bowling is definitively not Orwell. He is someone who wants only to extract something from the landscape or to defile it. His happiest boyhood memories are of roaming the fields with a gang of older lads who think it fun to steal a nest full of chicks from a hedgerow and to stamp them to death on the ground. He and his friends fish, though they're not really friends. They fish competitively and acquisitively, and George's mother always refuses to cook the muddy specimens he brings home. Only once does he stumble across an unfished, undefiled pond, hidden away in a lost glade and full of fat, sleepy perch. Of course, he has no rod with him, and he never again finds the mystical pool. But when he is away at war, he discovers a pool in some corner of a foreign field that is forever full of unfishable fish, and is moreover surrounded by oddly familiar poplars. Again, he glimpses the possibility of a different kind of interaction with the landscape. The thought of escaping for perhaps a whole day, sorry, <laughs> um, right, out, right out of the atmosphere of war, to be sitting under the poplar trees, fishing for perch, away from the company, away from the noise and the stink and the uniforms and the officers and the saluting and the sergeant's voice. Fishing is the opposite of war. Suddenly, it's not quite clear whether this is George Bowling or George Orwell speaking. In Homage to Catalonia, Orwell had explicitly contrasted his experience of his bullet wound with the peace offered by the image of a pool full of unfished fish, which he discovers in the hospital in Huesca. I had, for the time being, a good deal of pain from the damage I had done myself in falling, and my voice had disappeared almost completely, though I had never had a moment's pain from the bullet wound itself. There was a pleasant garden in the hospital grounds and in it was a pool with goldfishes and some small dark grey fish, bleak, I think. I used to sit watching them for hours. 
the poplar fringed site of Orwell's injury and the poplar fringed pool where bowling fantasizes about escaping from war find their bitter apotheosis in the pool bowling finally returns to on his doomed mission to rediscover the innocent slumbering countryside of his childhood. Of course, the impossible pool has succumbed to the destructive tendencies latent in, latent in bowling himself. It is dank and polluted, full of rubbish and fringed not by poplars, but by an ugly new housing estate, which is, has carved the country into mean little plots which can be sold to smug suburban, suburbanites just like him. The pool represents Bowling's sensory connection to something bigger and more beautiful than himself, and it's been infected by ruination and despair. And so, as he now realises, as he. But after Spain and after receiving his life-changing tuberculosis diagnosis, Orwell himself never again lost touch with feeling, both as emotion and as sensation. He recognised that the fight against fascism had to be founded on truth if it was to succeed, and truth had to be felt in the body, in the flesh. So as I come to the end of this talk, this occurs to me. Everything since modernism has in some way been about critiquing the fragment, the mismatch, the untotal, the slippery, the insufficient, everything that resists formulation into a smooth Weltanschauung, a frictionless body. But for Orwell, finally, the impetus was in the opposite direction. He really wanted to find a theory of everything, to reintegrate the interrupted body-mind and make sense of history, a work of reparation which might occur, if only for a moment, within the force field of his writerly imagination, also he hopes and strives for. This, for Orwell, is a more ethical and defensible position for a writer. He still begins by necessity with the fragment, and more importantly for him, with the feelings caused by the moral and physical injuries of political injustice. But his impetus is reparative as well as diagnostic. Form, nature, ethics, all must be understood in their imminence, in their accessibility to the human body and mind. George Woodcock compared his friend Orwell to Antaeus, the demigod of ancient Greek mythology who draws his strength from the earth. Orwell's belly stayed in touch with the earth, bridging the gap between individual minds, if not through the direct touch of sensory feeling, then via the virtual touch of feeling with. Sympathy, not just as the uncanny ghost feelings of mirror neurons and chiasmic embodiment, but as a radical ethical position, the only one Orwell finally was able to sustain. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>